Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let's try this again. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Come on, let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, put your hands together like you're excited that we serve a great God and he's greatly to be praised. Come on, when should you praise him? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Our God, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Oh, he's worthy to be praised. Somebody say hallelujah today. Come on, somebody say hallelujah today. Amen, amen. If you have your programs with you, amen, we have our opening call to worship, responsive reading. If you'll join in with us today on this glorious day that we call Good Friday, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Come, let us gather again in the shadows of the cross of Christ. Who would have guessed that the height and the depth and the length and the width of God's love might look like this, a forsaken savior on a cross? Let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ and commit ourselves to remember the price paid. Let us live our lives in a way that indicates why this Friday is called good. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, say hallelujah like you're happy to be in worship today. Come on, somebody say hallelujah like you're excited to be in worship. Hallelujah, amen, amen. Our music ministry at this time is going to lead us in our opening hymn at the cross. Come on, all everybody join in and sing as our music ministry leads us. Amen. Let us sing this great hymn of the church. At last and did
Amen. At the cross, at the cross. Amen. You may take your seat at this time. We're going to have Pastor Bridgeforth is going to come and pray with us. Then after that, we're going to have scripture readings by Elder Hayes and Reverend Taylor in that order. Come on, let's encourage them as they come. Amen. Good afternoon. Our opening prayer is printed in our program today. Let us pray together. Oh God of infinite love and power, we gather together on this Good Friday to reflect on the passion of Christ. God, we are utterly humbled in the presence of such love and mercy. We ask that you would open our hearts this day to the goodness of Good Friday. We ask that you will fill us with your love and power. Fill us with the spirit of holiness. God, we repent of our sins and ask that you would remove them far away from us today and offer us afresh this life in Christ which indeed makes all things new. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. We'll have... Uh... Reverend Taylor, come if he could come and read Psalm 22 and Luke 23 at this time. Come on, somebody say amen. Come on, let's encourage him as he comes today. Amen, amen. Come on, let's thank God for this servant of the Lord. Amen. Please be patient with me. Psalm 22, and it reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Art thou so far from helping me, and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou heareth me not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lips. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. 
strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gapped upon me with their mouths as a rape, as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a postured, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaw and thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my festers. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength has thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth for thou have heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye that seek Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seeds of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him, but when cried unto him, he heard, my praise shall be of thee in a great congregation. I will pray my vows before him that fear him. The meat shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the end of the world shall remember and turn unto thee, Lord. And all the kindred of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed, <coughs> excuse me, a seed shall serve him, it shall be counted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he has done this. Amen. We're going to move over to Luke, the 23rd chapter now. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to start at uh, verse 34, and it reads, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. <coughs> Excuse me again. 
if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doest not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. <coughs> Excuse me again. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou cometh into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together, that they, that to that sight, beholding the things which were done, <coughs> excuse me, smote their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off beholding these things. God's word is already blessed. May we be blessed by the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his holy and divine word. Amen. Amen. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Is that your testimony today? If you're going to praise with us, come on and put those hands together, and we're going to sing this old standard of the church. It says, Jesus, how, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. Come on and help us lift up this great song of the church. I need to see some hands going together and some foot feet tapping.
Good afternoon, beloved. What a rousing testimony I'll never forget what the Lord has done for me. I wear two hats this afternoon in form in the form of greeting. The first hat is I greet you on behalf of the Arlington Coalition of Black Clergy and our president, the Reverend Dr. Delicia Davis of the Callaway United Methodist Church, who has assembled us and convened us so that we can ponder and pause to ponder the paradox of the moment. This is a Good Friday. And only with the perspective of the lens of Christianity can we find any goodness in state-sponsored execution. But that is at the heart of the Christian faith. And it is in that spirit that we welcome you to this ecumenical gathering. As such, we want to recognize all of our public elected officials. And so if we have any present with us today, won't you please stand so that we can give you proper deference and respect in the moment. Amen. I see our Commonwealth attorney. Amen. I might be out of line. And my mama always told me that my mouth is going to get me in trouble. But it used to be a time when our county board was tripping over themselves to get here. And now they show us a disrespect by not showing up. We may need to make some statements. Amen. The second hat I wear is to welcome you on behalf of the Mount Olive Church as its pastor. We are always glad to see you for this occasion and any gathering for which our doors are open to the Arlington Coalition of Black Clergy. So welcome on this day and God be praised. As such, as the pastor of this house, I want to inform you of something that we're going to be doing that I think is uh, seminal for our community. On the 27th of April from 10 to noon, we are going to be showing a movie entitled Saving Claire, which is in collaboration with Marymount University. It is dealing with falls prevention. And in light of the fact that a former United States Senator just left this world as the exacerbated condition of a fall, it all behooves us to learn how not to fall, how to survive a fall, and how to recover from a fall. So we hope to see you on Saturday, the 27th of April from 10 to noon. Amen? Amen. Again, welcome to this place and welcome to this period of sacred and reflective worship. Come on, let's thank God for Dr. Victor. Come on, let's thank God for him for always hosting us with a spirit of excellence. Come on, somebody say amen. We thank God for what he means to the kingdom of God. We thank God for what he means to the community. And of course, the clergy, we thank God for what he means to us. Come on, somebody say amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen, amen. We thank God for his leadership. Amen. Listen, there's a preacher in the building, y'all. Somebody say amen. Come on, how many people love the Word of God? Oh, come on, how many people really love the Word of God? If we ever needed the Word before, we sure do need it now. And so we thank God for Dr. Nelson that's in the building, y'all. Somebody say amen. Amen. My neighbor, my friend, my brother, amen, from Lomax AME Zion. Come on, put your hands together for him, amen. We know God's going to use him in a mighty way to bless us today. But can you do me a favor and take your right hand and point your right hand to Dr. Nelson and say, Dr. Nelson, we're praying for you and we're praying with you. Let the Lord use you to bless us. Now say, preach the gospel. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, preach the gospel. Now, if you're looking forward to a powerful word, come on, put your hands together with a spirit of expectation. Amen. 
After our music ministry has blessed us, the next voice you'll hear will be Dr. Nelson. Amen.
You know, the reality is that even though we weren't physically present on the day that they crucified our Lord, we were there because our sin was on the cross, so we were there. Let me thank the music ministry for reminding us of the solemnity of this moment. I would ask you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter, and we're going to begin in verse number 45, and then we'll move down to verse 50. Matthew 27, beginning at verse number 45. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Verse 50. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. Let us pray. All wise and gracious God, we thank you for this Good Friday and for what it means to not just the church, but to the world. We thank you for those who are gathered here in this place. We thank you, God, that they thought it not robbery to come and to remember your sacrifice for the whole world on that first Good Friday. We pray now, God, that your Holy Spirit would come with power and conviction. I pray, God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable unto thee, for you are my strength and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' name I pray us all say, amen. amen. To our presiding officer, the Reverend Craig Harcum, who is my brother and the pastor of Macedonia Baptist Church. To our wonderful president of the Arlington Coalition of Black Clergy, the Reverend Dr. Delicia Davis, the pastor of Callaway United Methodist Church. To our host pastor and now the dean of pastors in the Arlington community, the Reverend Dr. James Victor Jr., the pastor of the Mount Olive Baptist Church, to all of the clergy of the Arlington Coalition of Black Clergy, and to the members of Lomax AME Zion Church, I'm going to ask you to stand very quickly, the members of Lomax AME Zion Church, where we worship, witness, and work to the max. It's good to see you. To all of my father's children, and most importantly, let me acknowledge the presence of my intelligent, anointed, and beautiful life partner and ministry partner, my wife, the Reverend Dr. Tina Nelson. If you would stand, please. I greet you in the marvelous and matchless name of Jesus, who is the Christ. In 1976, the original Freaky Friday movie was released. I was 10 years old at the time, and so I was in that target audience for the movie. The plot was simple. A mother and a daughter who were at odds with each other not understanding each other's viewpoint, wish that they could switch lives. Be careful what you ask for. 
In the movie, the wish of the mother and the daughter was granted on Friday the 13th when they switched bodies and lives. The mom became a teenager and the daughter became a mother. The movie is filled with freaky things that happened when a mother and daughter switched places. You need only use your imagination to think about the things that would have happened if you were to switch places with your child. And from then on, it was truly a Freaky Friday. Throughout the history of Christianity, Good Friday, which probably started out as God's Friday, has always been one of the most, if not most, sacred days in the life of Christians. Only in Christian theology could a day that is significant for being the day that the Son of God died be understood to be a Good Friday. However, the kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of this world. Yes, in the kingdom of God, a bad day can become a good day. Good Friday is a day of mourning, not a day of festive joy. You know, sometimes in the church, we just want to celebrate all the time. Everything has to be up and happy and loud all the time. But we need to understand the solemnity of Good Friday before we rush to the celebration of Resurrection Sunday. This afternoon, I won't bore you with a historical overview of Good Friday, nor will I try to impress you with an ontological explanation of Good Friday. But if you give me a few moments, I will try and share with you a theological understanding of what makes Good Friday a Friday like no other Friday in human history. And so if you indulge me for just a few moments, I'd like to preach from the subject of Freaky Friday a Freaky Friday. Church, the truth be told, I believe that the first Good Friday was not only a Freaky Friday, but it was the freakiest of all Fridays. Look at the events that are recorded in Matthew 27, beginning at verse 45. Here we encounter Jesus who has been nailed to a cross like he was a scandalous criminal, even though he was not. Time won't permit me to recount the story, but we ought to take some time today and go and read the biblical accounts in the Gospels of what Jesus went through for you and for me. The persecution, the vilification, the objectification, the humiliation, the prosecution, the terrorization, and the brutalization that Jesus experienced for you and for me. But our focus today will be on the freaky things that took place on that first Good Friday as recorded in Matthew. Verse 45 records, from noon on darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. The first thing that we see in our text is it was a freaky Friday as darkness covered the whole earth. Today's Good Friday service began at 12 noon, the same time that they experienced the freaky occurrence of darkness covering the whole earth. That is what they believed, that it wasn't just in Jerusalem where it was dark, but darkness covered the whole land. The understanding is that it was dark in Asia, it was dark in Africa, it was dark in the Americas, it was dark in Europe. Everywhere there was darkness from noon to three o'clock. Not only was the darkness expansive, but the text also implies that the darkness was comprehensive. This was a complete darkness. And, and how do we know this? Because in the language of the Bible, it was a three-hour period. And we know that three is the number of perfection, which means that it was perfectly and completely dark. For three hours, the S-U-N refused to shine, while the S-O-N was shining in his finest hour. John 1 reminds us, in him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. On that first Freaky Friday over 2,000 years ago, like the mother and daughter in the movie of the same name, I wanna argue based on the text that the S-O-N and the S-U-N switch places. Utter darkness like the darkness that covered the face of the deep in the beginning was beginning to be experienced worldwide so that people could see the worst 
spark of the true light that was shining on the cross. The world needed to understand that the darkness could not overcome the light and that the S-O-N was doing his work, but the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness could not overcome it. The light that is Jesus Christ is still shining on this Good Friday. Even though we are often walking in darkness, over 2,000 years ago as they walked in darkness, there were those who did not comprehend the light that is Jesus Christ, nor did they understand that darkness cannot overcome the light. You would think that when the sun refuses to shine, as Jesus is being crucified on this first Freaky Friday, that some would understand that something miraculous was taking place. You would think that everyone would have recognized the inbreaking of God in the affairs of the world, but perhaps that just thought that there was a solar eclipse going on. You know, we're about to have one on April the 8th, and people are not going to associate it with the move of God. What is God saying to us even right now? In 2024, it remains a freaky Friday as darkness covers the entire earth from racial and gender prejudice, wealth and health inequities, wars and rumors of wars, gun violence run amok, and a democracy that is teetering on the brink. But God sent me by to remind someone that while there may be complete and utter darkness in the world, that just because the S-U-N is not shining, it doesn't mean that the S-O-N is still not doing his work. Just because the sun is not shining in your life and there's darkness in your personal space, it doesn't mean that the S-O-N isn't shining down upon you. And so, yes, it was a freaky Friday as darkness covered the whole earth. But beginning in verse 50, the Gospel of Matthew records, then Jesus again with a loud voice uh, and he breathed his last breath. What happens when the Son of God dies? What happens when the Son of God gives up the ghost so that you and I might have a right to the tree of life? What happens when the Son of God lays down his life so that he might pick it back up again? What happens when the Son of God dies with an eye towards defeating death and the grave? What happens when the Son of God dies so that you can, he can take away the sins of the world? Well, in response to this momentous moment, the death of the Son of God, this moment when Jesus was fulfilling his very divine purpose, because you know he was born to die, Verse 51 records that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. It wasn't just a freaky Friday in terms of the darkness that had covered the earth, but the second reason that it was a freaky Friday is because the curtain of the temple was torn in two. On this freaky Friday, in the natural, one could say that an earthquake caused some structural damage to the temple on the particular day in the holies of holies. That's the natural explanation of what happened. But I want us to understand that there's a spiritual, theological, and metaphysical thing that was going on. Theologically, at that moment, a new covenant was coming into place. As Hebrew 8 reminds us, but Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry. And to that degree, he is now the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted through better promises. I want us to understand that Hebrew 9 goes on to tell us, but when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. We need to understand that no longer would the people of God, you and me, need an intermediary to go before God on our behalf. There was a freaky shift that was going on on that Friday. As children of God, each of us was being given direct access to the heart of God through Jesus Christ. The ripping of the curtain in two was, in effect, a demolishment 
of the temple as the sole site of God's presence in the world as Jews believed at that time. Yes, God made a switch on that Good Friday so that every one of us could call cause ourselves a child of God who has the spirit of God living in us that we would become the very temples where God would reside on this Good Friday. Somebody needs to be reminded that a switch was made and we no longer need the blood of bulls and goats to atone for us. Jesus paid it all and his blood was once perfect and a sufficient sacrifice for all the sins of the world. On this Good Friday, somebody needs to be reminded that a switch was made. Indirect access was switched out for direct access. You no longer have to go to the priest. You no longer have to go to Reverend Victor to ask him to intercede on your behalf. No, all you need to do is cry out to your Lord and you have direct access to him. Why? Because the curtain of the temple was torn in two. But there's more to the story in Matthew 27. The earthquake that occurred in response to Jesus' death didn't just tear the curtain in two. There were also some rocks that cried out on that day. It was a freaky Friday because the rocks cried out in place of Jesus' disciples. Just a few days before on Palm Sunday, you know we just celebrated Palm Sunday and we were singing Hosanna, blessed is the name of the Lord. As the account of Jesus' triumphal entry records in Luke 19, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice about all the deeds of power that he had done. But some of the members of the church, I mean the Pharisees, uh, said to Jesus, teach, teacher, order your disciples to stop. Jesus answered, I tell you, if these are silent, the stones would shout out for me. Well, church, it's five days later. Look at the text. Do you see the disciples anywhere? Where are they? Is anybody praising God while he's on the cross of Calvary? Jesus' disciples are nowhere to be found. Where are his followers shouting about his deeds of power? Where are the people that he had healed? Where are the people that saw the signs and wonders? They're nowhere to be found. And so as Jesus said, I will allow the rocks to cry out for me on that freaky Friday. We're seeing some rocks changing places with Jesus' followers because Jesus will be praised. Even if you don't praise him, the rocks are going to cry out for him on this freaky Friday. Will the rocks have to cry out for you? Will the rocks have to praise God for the deeds of power that have taken place in your life? The diseases that he's healed you from, the finances he's replenished, the relationships he's restored, the dreams that he's fulfilled, the battles that he's won, the enemies that he's defeated, the doors that he's opened, the doors that he's closed, the grace that he's granted, and the mercy that he keeps giving over and over again. It was a freaky Friday because Jesus was hanging on the cross. And because no one would, would praise him, the rocks had to cry out on that Good Friday. Well, as I prepare to take my seat, there was one more thing that happened on that freaky Friday. It's the thing that always arrests my attention when I read this text. It begins in verse 52. And we find that as a result of this earthquake in the natural, that the tombs also were opened up. And it said many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered into the holy city. Say what? They came out the tombs and walked up into the holy city. Let me be clear what Matthew 27 is painting a picture of. In our modern day context, we think of everyone pretty much as being buried below ground. The coffin goes below ground. But that's not how they buried people during Jesus' time. 
everyone was buried into the side of a rock. It was a, a, a tomb that was cut out and they were placed inside the tomb. We're not talking about coffins being unearthed. That's not what the text is talking about. What the text is talking about is dead people who were in their tombs already above ground who came to life when Jesus died. But wait a minute, it's not Resurrection Sunday yet. But our text says that these folks were dead and when Jesus died, they came back to life. I'm here to tell you that Jesus switched places with them. He died so that they could get up. And he didn't need to wait for Resurrection Sunday for his power to come and lift them up. I'm here to remind somebody that Jesus' death can even lift you out of your dead places. Even where you find yourself in a dead place, on this Good Friday, you can be raised to new life, just like the bodies that were in the tomb. One of my favorite movies, or lines from a movie, is the movie The Sixth Sense. Y'all remember that movie? And in that movie, the famous line was, I see dead people. There was a young boy who had the power to see dead people. And the thing about it was, he could see the dead people, but the dead people didn't know they were dead. He was dealing with someone who was a psychologist who thought he was doing psychology on him. The psychologist didn't realize that he wasn't alive. He was dead, and the young boy was dealing with him in his deceased state. I want to tell you that today, as I look around me, I see dead people all around me. People who are dead in their own sin. People who are dead in their own self-esteem that's low. People who are dead in their minds that they don't think they can do it anymore. I see dead people everywhere I go. But I'm here to tell you that on this Good Friday, the God that I know went to the cross so that you could get up even on a good Friday, to new life. Well, my task is not to preach Resurrection Sunday. You need to go somewhere and hear the rest of the story. But from this text, it says that after he was resurrected, they went from the tombs and they walked into the holy city. I'm here to tell you the reason why we need Good Friday is because we need Resurrection Sunday is because the process has not been completed. You can get up today, but I want you to be able to walk into the holy city. And the only way that you can walk in to the holy city is because Jesus is going to get up on Resurrection Sunday morning. So I just stopped by to tell you that over 2,000 years ago, it was the freakiest of Freaky Fridays. There was darkness that covered the whole earth. There was a temple where the curtain had been torn in two. There were rocks that cried out for the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that some dead people got up and began to walk around waiting for Jesus to finish his work. It's a Freaky Friday, all right. Don't let anybody tell you that it's not a Freaky Friday. Because only in the economy of God can a day like today become something that we can celebrate. It was a Freaky Friday. God bless. Is Pastor Fimster here? Because if not, I'm going to... Is he here? Come on. Amen. Will you come on. Amen. And so what a Friday it was. Amen. Amen. And what a Friday it is. Uh, the good news, that, that, that's good, and it might be news to some of us that folks got up and walked because Jesus changed places with them. 
We've come now to offer uh, our altar prayer for this, for this hour. Would you please uh, pray with me as we pray together our altar prayer. Our Father and our Lord, because of your grace and mercy, because of your goodness, and because of the, sacri the, the, the salvation that your son brought for us at Calvary through his completed work, I stand at this hour as an intercessor. I stand in the company of a cloud of intercessors. We've come to thank you for being our Lord and for assigning us work to do. We come to intercede on behalf of family and friends and neighbors, enemies and immigrants, refugees, aliens, whomever may not know you. We've come to stand. We come to stand in the power of your grace, the power of your love, the strength. We come to stand to ask that you would allow our lives to be light so that they might see you, so that they might see you in our words and through our deeds, and so that we all may be constrained to come and to give thanks. We thank you for the altar and for the opportunity to come and for making it possible for us to come. We thank you for salvation. We ask, Lord, that you would make it possible that we would remember you, not just on this Friday, but every day. Please renew within us a right spirit. Give us a clean heart. Revive in us the ministry that you have assigned so that uh, our days may be lived in love and that you may be the light of our lives. We ask this prayer because you said that we should always pray in the name of your darling son who is our Lord and our Savior. We do pray. All the intercessors said together, amen, amen, and amen.